Hello and welcome back to the channel. In a manner of speaking, this is a continuation of uh, what we have already spoken about, lines, plans and uh, graphic representation of uh, shapes of holes. Today we will be talking about framing. And this is a subject near and dear to my heart, as some of you might be aware. I wrote my master's thesis on uh, framing in the 17th century. And really, this is the period in which most of the changes begin to happen, uh, for two reasons. Usually the explanation is listed as timber shortages, but the bulk of my research suggests that it is not so much timber shortages, which were relative rather than absolute that caused it. It was the growing size of ships. It was the longer uh, deployments of ships. Suddenly the navies from coast protection roles have been asked to fulfill projection of power roles over great distances, including the Caribbean, including the East Indies, etc. That, of course, uh, increase the demand on the strength of the vessels. And the strength of the vessel is derived from the framing timbers. But this also caused significant increase in sizes of ships in order to be able to bear the artillery that they were expected to bear. And that also had something to do with the strengthening and the changes in the frame construction. So without further ado, let us delve into this, to me, highly entertaining subject. In this talk we will include, as I did in my uh, master's thesis in the past, two elements, mostly partially documentary evidence that we have, some illustrations, some contracts, and of course some uh, other written descriptions. And the real question is how does this bear when compared to archaeological evidence? And uh, Remarkably closely, as a matter of fact, is the answer to this question. So, talking about framing, the first thing to determine, of course, is that uh, to define the term room and space. And you're going to see this written in many different ways. Uh, room and space, timber and space, room and space. There are many variations, uh, but essentially they mean exactly the same Thing. And that is, if this down here is the keel on the drawing, and the vertical sections are showing right here, these are the floor timbers, these are the fatacks that you see. This section here is illustrating what a room and space really means. It means the distance from, the far, from one face of one frame to the corresponding face of the following frame. This is what room and space means. That is always proportionate to the length in, uh, to, uh, of the vessel and to the class of the vessel. The actual sided dimension, this is the four and a half dimension of the timber is known as sided, while the depth of the timber is known as molded dimension because on that face is where the mold, the pattern was laid down to shape the timber, to draw it and to cut the timber to correspond to this pattern or mold. That's why sided and molded dimensions. They make perfect sense once you see how they came about. This dimension is extremely important both in ship design, ship construction, but also quite frankly in ship archaeology because we deal with partially preserved hulls. And if we are able, even if it is only partial uh, survival, but we are able to measure one such room and space, we can develop a very close idea of what the original size of the ship has been. We have discussed the complica how complicated the shape of a sailing vessel in this period is. No need to continue kicking a dead horse. It's not going to start running. So it is obvious that it requires more than one timber to shape the vessel in the physical, three-dimensional, actual construction sense of the word. Uh, 
And as a general rule, the frame of a vessel consists, not as a general rule, a frame of a vessel consists of a floor timber, fatak, and top timber. The fatak is framing really the belly of the vessel, the underwater uh, size, the floor timber, it is obvious. Uh, the fataks, very frequently in early documents, they are written as foot hooks because they were hooked around the floor timbers. And this is particularly true in the Mediterranean tradition where we have vessels from a variety of dates and variety of periods and uh, building traditions that actually still had exactly a hook-shaped scarf. Perhaps a subject for a different conversation. The number of fataks that shape the vessel, uh, that frame the vessel, is directly uh, related to the size of the ship. Obviously, the bigger the ship, the more fataks are required. By the early 19th century, we're on a three-decker, we're talking about something in the vicinity of six, seven or more fataks. They all would be far shorter, much straighter pieces of timber than you're going to see on an earlier vessel. It is very basic. In late medieval times, early modern period, on a number of wrecks, we have discovered that uh, a frame can consist of only three timbers. This appears to have been the case with, for example, Warwick, which was lost in a hurricane in Castle Harbor, Bermuda, in 1619 and was almost certainly built around 1617, according to Dendro. In other words, the ship was quite new. So you see the first, the floor timber, the first fatak overlapping the floor timber, which frequently in 17th century contracts, this is uh, described as giving scarf to the floor timber. And that this overlap between the wrong heads of the floor timber and the heel of the fatak is known as the scarf. They may or may not be fastened to each other. And in fact, for most of the early period, um, for most of the 17th century, especially in Nordic traditions, the floor timbers and the fataks are not fastened far enough to each other. This changes towards the end of the 17th century, and of course in the 18th century they are completely fastened. But in earlier periods they are not. So if you remove the planking, all the bits and pieces of the frame of the ship are just going to fall down. Right. As time progressed and larger ships needed to be constructed, a second fatak had to be added. So, you still have, over here you have the keel. Let's see how long I can play with this and drop. And following traditions, I should really be able to drop it on the floor and then unable to find it within the length of the video. But that was my uh, Mr. Bean impression. So, the keel with the floor timbers crossing the keel. In the English, in most traditions, with the exception of the Nordic Dutch, North Dutch tradition, the floor timbers have to be perpendicular to the center line of the vessel, perpendicular to the keel. That is what controls the shape of the vessel. And some treatises are even going to describe you exactly how to horn the timbers, that is to say, how to make sure that they are truly at 90 degrees to the center line. Once the floor timbers are uh, set up in contemporary construction practice, people will start planking the vessel. And once they are reaching the wrong heads, this is where the bottom of the vessel, really the turn of the bilge, where the floor timbers are beginning to curve upwards into the belly of the vessel. This is where you're going to find the first fatak, which is this timber right over here. The first fataks are essentially positioned between the floor timbers. And the first fatak and the floor timber together are uh, known as the room and space. They fill up the space. Then, subsequently, a second fatak was added to this. In this drawing we also see a third fatak uh, possibility or otherwise known as naval timbers. Naval timbers are mentioned in uh, Captain Smith's uh, dictionary and also of course by Mainwaring. 
but both authors agree that they were very rarely framed separately from the fatics and usually they were part of the fatic timber itself in the archaeological uh, context so far i have never seen a separately framed uh, naval fatic this is the theoretical in practical terms as you go up the side of the vessel the sided dimensions of the timbers will decrease. And as they decrease, you're going to have opening between the timbers. Some of the contracts of the 17th century surviving in the National Archives in Great Britain actually specify that there should be room between the timbers so that air can circulate uh, between the timbers and thus prevent rot. So far, so good. That continues. This is a drawing that is illustrating a two fatic system. And this seems to have been used for most of the two decades, for most of the 17th century. In the next drawing, I would like to show you an isometric drawing of a system that is a two fatic system. Here is the floor timber, here is the first fatic, the second fatic, the top timbers, and of course you see already the beams of the deck with the lodging knees. This is how the overwhelming majority of 17th century ships would have been framed. With this, I propose to end this part of the video, since we really have gone through most of the 17th century. In the next video, in the next part of this, we will be discussing the changes that happened towards the end of the century. How did they happen and uh, what do we see in the archaeological record in this? Giving you also one or two actual archaeological examples of how this looks in practice. And why I'm so confident that this is exactly how ships were really built in the period. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for asking questions. A big, big thank you to the generous sponsors who are uh, helping this channel exist. Thank you for your support. It does mean a lot. A quick reminder, as I am, when you're watching this uh, video, I'm already in the field excavating shipwrecks somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Well, the Black Sea in this case, close enough. Therefore, I would like to remind you that my access to internet and my ability to answer comments is quite limited. I will do my best to catch up on this once I am back from the field work.